Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to say a few biographical remarks about uh, Orly, who probably is one of the most impressive academics you will find today. Uh, she is the, she has an endowed chair at University of San Diego, uh, the Don Weckstein Professor of Employment and Labor Law. She teaches in the area of employment law, administrative law, and her research encompasses those areas as well as new governance theory and obviously intellectual property. So she has a diverse set of scholarly interests. Uh, she has uh, written or co-authored four books, and she has written numerous law review articles and published in some of the top journals in the United States. Uh, she graduated top of her class at Tel Aviv University, Faculty of Law. She went on to clerk for the Supreme, uh, Supreme Court Justice of the Supreme Court of Israel. Uh, she has two degrees from Harvard Law School. Uh, she also uh, was an intelligence officer in the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, and she speaks five languages. <laughs> so she's quite an underachiever. Uh, what what uh, will she do next? Um, well, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Professor Orly LaBelle to talk with us today about her book, You Don't Own Me. Thank you, Ed. That was a really kind and um, exaggerated introduction. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of it is true, including my military intelligence uh, gig, my first career. and. Um, a lot of it actually culminated in wanting to write this book, You Don't Own Me, uh, because uh, I do care about secrets and keeping confidential information confidential. That's my military intelligence hat. I do care about intellectual property and incentivizing innovation and creativity. Uh, but I also very much care about the public domain and not reaching perverse uh, results from very long-standing statutes that have goals and have intentions of promoting progress in arts and science. And I uh, wanted to tell this story of the battles of Barbie and uh, the starting with the current times of the battles of Barbie versus her competitor suddenly after decades of dominance in the market, suddenly coming out of the blue from the perspective of Mattel executives, a doll that for the first time, as Judge Kaczynski writes in his opinion, knocks Barbie off her pedestal and takes more market share than Barbie. This is unheard of from, from Mattel's perspective um, over the past 50 years, really. Um, in the holiday season. So what happened, they asked themselves, and they find out that what happened was that a former employee of them, of theirs, thought of this idea of a bratty doll, a different doll than Barbie, and left Mattel and sold that idea to MGA, uh, an up-and-coming privately held toy company in a very concentrated market. The toy industry was a very t concentrated market, um, basically a duopoly between Mattel and Hasbro. And um, this entrepreneur, MGA uh, CEO, founder, Isaac Larian, buys the idea of Bratz, develops it, invests a lot of money in it. And because Mattel finds out that the seed of the idea, the initial concept of Bratz, came from a former employee, and they find this out only after Bratz is a huge success, they decide to go the litigation route. So the story to me is specific about the toy and entertainment industry, and uh, Mattel is, I, I felt like it's a story that had to be told because so many colorful personalities on both sides of the litigation. Uh, the story is fascinating because it, was tried twice. There are two trials, and it's a complete roller coaster, completely different outcomes uh, that are partly different because two sets of attorneys, so different attorney teams, makes a huge difference. Two different, very different judges, and in the middle goes up to 
Judge Kaczynski and his panel on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, another very controversial, um, colorful figure, um, I should say, then Judge Kaczynski, former judge. Um, and, um, and I sat down with him to interview him about uh, the cases, uh, and I, I sat down with the executives on both sides, and, and uh, with, I talked to jurors, so two different jur sets of jurors, and very importantly, two different judges. I, I said this uh, and on the, uh, in the trial court um, that really made a difference in, in this story that is like the poet said, the, where the whole world meets in a single nest, where you have these questions of who owns ideas, who uh, owns intellectual property, creativity, innovation, how are contracts that extend these, these uh, concepts that we have in the law, in the Patent Act and in copyright, in trade secrets and trade market, um, how are they interpreted? But also, because this is a cultural icon, this story, including in the trial itself, opened windows into how do we create images of womanhood, images of race and ethnicity, and, and, and there, was, there were claims of uh, racism that ran through the trials. Um, how do we think about competition and markets and the American dream? And in general, like, how do we create products, consumer products? And, and it really allowed me to start in present time and then also go back in history and find some of the art ironies of how history repeats and what was the secret history of Barbie that also in its inception turns out started with an IP dispute. Um, so before I go into some of these, these histories and, and doctrinal questions, I'll, I'll read to you just to um, set the, the stage for the case. Um, the, it's not even chapter one, it's from the very introduction um, of the book, introducing us to this unlikely hero of the Mattel versus MGA case, Carter Bryant, who is a designer at Mattel and quite unhappy, um, dreamt to be a, a fashion designer and kind of takes this job at Mattel as a second best, but has a lot of creative ideas, but they're never really developed. So um, here's the, the first paragraph of the introduction to You Don't Own Me. She was blonde and beautiful, statuesque, with long slender legs, a tiny waist, and a chest so large that Finnish researchers claimed any similarly endowed woman would surely tip over. For years, Carter Bryant dutifully served her. He styled her hair, dressed her in skirts, dresses, luxurious gowns, adorned her in jewelry, and even applied her makeup. She always looked fabulous. Day after day, week after week, she was unblemished, shiny, and new. And in a $3 billion industry, she dominated over 90% market share for five decades. Perhaps that was what Carter despised, her perfection, the absence of a single flaw. She never changed. While people gained weight, their skin wrinkled and sagged, their hair grayed, Barbie stood perfect and frozen against a changing world. While she remained ageless and pristine, the world that she had been born into ceased to exist. Everything was raunchier and more perverse. Barbie remained maddenly clean. A real artist, Carter saw the beauty in the broken, the peculiar, the queer, perhaps even the grotesque. Like many creative people trapped in dead-end jobs, he experienced the angst of a servant whose golem had become the master. He imagined a new icon that better reflected the modern world, using the beauty of real people. Carter had not intended to assault Barbie's persona, her public image, or those invested in maintaining it. He hadn't planned to confront his master. He could not have consciously da dared to dream of the millions he would make from his rebellion, the millions in ensuing losses, and the decade-long legal battle that would not only change Barbie and the Mattel Corporation, but forever alter both the entire toy industry and the very laws governing creativity and competition. He certainly could not, couldn't have foreseen the incredibly ferocious feud 
between his overpowering ex-employer and the flamboyant entrepreneur who gambled and risked it all to take a chance on him. Nor did he predict that lawyers would drag both his life partner, Richard Ehrman, and his own mother, Jane, to testify on his behalf, asking them to reveal deep-seated, intimate details of his life and passions. Most certainly, his dreams would not have included suffering depression and a stroke at the age of 41. Carter Bryant only wanted to build his own dream house away from Barbie. So I said that the story begins with a dispute between a former employee alongside a new competitor, a new entry uh, into a concentrated market, and a very dominant actor, uh, a corporation that has been around for a long time and has had a history of you know, a small army of inside and outside counsel uh, represented uh, in, in repeat uh, battles against um, not only competitors but artists and um, musicians and movie producers uh, and, and uh, you know small small artisans and I want to give you a background of um, why I think that even though I said this is you know where uh, the whole world meets in a single nest I think the story is really universal um, and I wanted to bring this story that maybe we're more familiar with in the context of Silicon Valley and uh, you know Facebook and and some of the battles that happen uh, between tech companies there was just you know Uber and Waymo uh, just settled and uh, stories that happen in like Michael Lewis style um, in the financial industries I wanted to bring them to Southern California where I work um, and to the entertainment and toy industry, which I think are, you know, one of the most important places to see who gets to speak, who gets to create when we're creating our our icons, our our messages, our um, you know our culture really. And so it, the the motivation to tell a single story that shows how difficult it is to shake. A, a concentrated market came from uh, a first book or the previous book that I wrote, Talent Wants to Be Free, which argued that we've had this bargain in intellectual property where we understand, you know, we have um, proprietary information, we have ownership over knowledge and, um, you know, invention, innovation, but there are limits in the law, in, in every body of law that we draw and those limits are a, a feature, they're not a bug, they, they um, police uh, the, the boundaries of ownership in order to allow for a, a lively, vivid, strong public domain, you know, the commons of, of knowledge. And what I was arguing in Talent Wants to Be Free is that beneath the radar we've had this expansion and kind of a subversion of that bargain through contractual arrangements. And I was kind of showing how um, intellectual property has to be understood in the context of, or, or in relation to other bodies of law, of um, antitrust and competition <coughs> law, of contract law and employment law. And at those intersections, we see uh, some of that expansion of the original bargain. And I've written, um, uh, a lot of scholarly articles about these, including with collaborators from business schools, from experimental psychology, um, where I've shown that motivation can be actually suppressed when we pierce the black box of corporate America and see that ownership is stripped from the actual inventors and, and creators and, and assigned in these broad strokes to corporations, motivation of the creators is suppressed, um, and certainly job mobility is suppressed, and that um, that has been a growing theme. 
And in fact, it was also really interesting to be working in California and teaching in California uh, because I was very interested in that exceptional policy that we've had since the inception of the state in California versus the rest of the country where California doesn't enforce non-compete agreements, non-compete contracts. And uh, when I was writing Talent Wants to be Free, and even more so today, there was an emerging empirical literature coming out of econ departments and business schools um, <laughs> that showed how California actually has gained from this, this policy, this voidance of all um, non-compete agreements with employees. Um, that it's part of the miracle of Silicon Valley that everybody wants to emulate, but also in other industries. So, uh, you know, it's not unique to computer science and um, tech, but um, in San Diego we have pharmaceuticals and biotech beach, and also they, they survive, they thrive actually, not only survive, they thrive under a regime that actually allows more flow and more leakage um, of of knowledge, of secrets, of, um, of n usage of networks that companies usually have an impulse to try to contain. And so I, I was very fortunate to be part of a global um, study on these issues. This is at the UN in Austria. Um, where we got more data about how openness and, and sort of more um, public domain and, and flow of uh, people and, and knowledge helps innovation and, and economic development. In 2016, I got a call in the summer from the White House um, to come speak about Talent Wants to be Free uh, before representatives of the President's policy team and the uh, Treasury Department, the Labor Department, and the Department of Justice, they were all interested in this suddenly um, getting new attention that wasn't there when I, when I was writing Talent Wants to be Free. I said, nobody's talking about this. Everybody's talking about the, what exactly are, what is patent eligibility, you know? Like, what, how do we draw the lines there? Um, and what is fair use? And these are all important questions, but look what's going on in other ways that we control um, the flow of information. And suddenly, people were more interested, including the White House. So I like saying that. I got a call from the White House. And I went, I flew the White House. I was in Berlin on the way to Tel Aviv. I, I changed my flight. And, um, and that, that resulted, this was August 2016, that resulted in becoming part of a work, uh, working group of the White House um, on, on these issues. And eventually, October 2016, so just before um, a turn in the administration, the president issued a call for action to the states to uh, st try to curtail the expansion of these non-competes. Again, not just because they were hurting employees who were bound to one company um, and suppressing wages, but also because from an innovation, an innovation standpoint, this was not uh, a good idea for, for regions. And um, there, you know, th that was a, a really important moment. Um, but to me, it also was a moment where I said, okay, now people kind of get the, the, the thing about non-competes. But in fact, in Talent Wants to be Free, I was arguing beyond just the straightforward non-compete that there are other arrangements that expand intellectual property and ownership um, that are that are problematic, and that we need to get the lines right there. So um, I had this whole map in my um, in my my scholarly work about how um, overly expansive NDAs, which again, it's a moment that people are talking about this. I get a lot of calls from reporters now about NDAs in relation to Me Too, and in fact, I'm arguing that you don't own me. That has this really broad generic um, contract that's at the you know, basis of, of the litigation that ensued. Um, and and it, has, it has a non-disclosure agreement, and it has these really broad assignment agreements, that it's the other side of the coin, that they're, that they're um, very much the same question of the ability to speak out against misconduct and, and um, 
to to um, voice concerns about uh, corporate culture, and then the ability also to to leave when people are unhappy. And and these these contracts have a chilling effect on on both of those um, behaviors. So. Um, Carter Bryant was working in California, so he didn't have a straightforward non-compete, but he did sign an innovation agreement that said that anything that he designs, anything that he improves, um, creates, innovates, um, conceives of, and it says whether um, still in the kind of ephemeral state, uh, um, you know, ideas, all of these um, categories that are really not legal categories and that go beyond the lines that uh, the Patent Act and the Copyright Act have drawn um, and the, the, what the Defend Trade Secret Act, um, I believe, um, allows. And it says in his contract, whether patentable or non-patentable, whether copyrightable or non-copyrightable, belongs to um, Mattel. And so, if you think about it, we're in, in intellectual property, we're always in the realm of intangible assets. But at the same time, my argument is that we have a spectrum of intangibility. And through these contracts, we're going, getting more and more into the intangible. So um, in the, under the Patent Act, we have that line that um, things that are um, abstract, that have not been reduced to practice, that are just in the conceptual uh, phase that are um, natural phenomenon, um, ephemeral, they, they are not patentable. And only um, the kind of more tangible in this intangible world um, inventions are patentable. We similarly have in the Copyright Act this distinction between ideas that are not copyrightable and uh, things that are expressions that, that are um, copyrightable. With trade secrets as well, we've had a long tradition in the, the Uniform Trade Secret Act and also um, now that it's a, a federal act, the Defend Trade Secret Act, which I've, I've um, been writing about quite a bit now and, and saying it's a missed opportunity that we didn't specifically art articulate these lines, but we have them and it's, it, it, it has um, been um, sort of codified into, in silence into the Defend Trade Secret Act and you see this in the WIMO Uber case, um, that uh, things that are general knowledge, that are skills, um, are not, cannot be trade secrets. It's only really something that is um, specialized to the company and um, it derives its value from being secret. And in the Uber Waymo case, the judge reminds this, uh, reminds the, the, the parties, specifically the, the Waymo Google party, to, that this is something that, of course, um, is important. It's that the basis of trade secrecy. He says, you're not telling me that an employee needs to undergo a lobotomy in order to move from one company to the other. And yes, we, we've, we've kind of agreed on that. Um, so we have these distinctions in every body of intellectual property. Um, but it, the contracts themselves attempt to, to kind of reach into the further intangible. Um, and they use these these words that are much more much broader, and so they kind of forget that wisdom that the the things that are outside the scope of intellectual property um, are also a feature. Um, and so with with Judge Kaczynski, when I sat down with him, and um, you know, as I said, he's a very controversial judge, but uh, also been very important in intellectual property jurisprudence, and um, being very um, firm on understanding the significance of a um, public domain to create culture and, and expanding this idea of fair use, he's very clear on the copyright side. And, and I ask him about this tension between Judge Kaczynski as a copyright uh, you know, jurisprudential mind and Judge Kaczynski on contracts. I, I uh, write in the book, and I argue that there is a tension there. He says, when he looks at these claims that um, because Carter Bryant was um, an employee of Mattel and um, we have this uh, hired to or, or work for hire um, doctrine under copyright and they say, you know, we, we own the copyright to whatever he sketched while he was an employee. And there's a lot of questions of 
when was the Eure when was the Eureka moment really uh, happening? Uh, the 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 story is fascinating because that's part of the you know uh, thing that you need to prove. How do you how does it come to you when? Uh, and he has a, a completely different story of when it happened. And there's also a question about weekends and nights. It's kind of the the term that the MGA team attorney team gave. It's defense uh, that you 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 do own t your time when you're dreaming, when you're sketching at home, and Mattel was absolutely clear that no, the contract also goes into the weekends and nights, and also into your dreams and your sleep, and and that was part of the the debate. But beyond all of that, um, when when Judge Kaczynski looks at you know even if he did come up with some of these ideas during his his work time at Mattel. If what they're claiming is ownership over copyright by virtue of his being employed, um, well, he, he reminds us. He says, Stephanie Meyer doesn't own the idea of sexy vampires uh, mating with mortals um, that existed before her. Uh, you know, we had Dracula and we had a lot of other books, and, and a lot of other books can be uh, written later on. That's the kind of trajectory of, uh, of human creation. Um, she only owns the specific ex expressions of um, these, these, uh, th this thread, this, this uh, creativity. Um, similarly, he says Degas doesn't own the idea of painting dancers. He only owns the specific, the specific uh, expression, the, what he actually painted. So he says all of that, and then immediately he moves to contract interpretation, and you see a completely different voice. He's like, well, it says conceived of. Um, so this could be things that are completely in the idea state, but it's more of a matter. He remands it because he thinks it's a matter of interpretation, of contract interpretation. <laughs> and I actually sit, sat down with him at lunch, and I asked him about it, and he's like, well, contract is a contract is a contract. And I didn't know that when I was putting in the interview, it would be, get some additional meaning and, and become so um, kind of, I would say, chilling uh, in, in context. Uh, when I quote him in the book, I, say, I, I write down that he says, you know, to me, even slavery could be a contract. Um, it's just a matter of consent. Um, we, you know, we have some public policies, and as a judge, I need to um, uphold that. But, but contra as a libertarian, he feels like contract should be enforced as it is. Um, and the reason I'm saying it's kind of chilling is that the, the controversy that uh, erupted afterwards, uh, it started with a clerk that said that the very first day that she started her clerkship, he said to her, now you're my slave for the next year. And uh, she said, indented servitude, maybe, you mean? Or, uh, and he said, no, slave. Um, so. So that was sort of all in the news. Um, but, but the bottom line about uh, these contracts is that um, as, as a scholar who studies these contracts and um, I, I, I've mined through a lot of not only these cases, but actually what's happening kind of on the ground. And there's some emerging uh, cases now, um, class actions of some uh, uh, kind of unilateral contracts that are generic. Um, that, that impose these restrictions that are uh, problematic. I mentioned um, these uh, questions in, un, with NDAs and, and what they do to our markets, our job markets, our uh, corporate transparency. Uh, Non-disparagement clauses are on the rise and kind of how they uh, send a signal of what employees can, can say and do. All of these are something that public policy has to think about and has to be concerned about because um, these contracts, not only are they most of the time not signed in, in some you know, form of negotiation and, and any kind of equal bargaining power, um, they are also uh, a concern because they're not, they don't just affect the two sides in this contract, uh, but they affect what we'll see in terms of um, new entry into the market they will be interpreted in very specific ways. And, and even when we have relatively sophisticated employees, relatively well-off employees, 
the chance that they will actually um, go all the way through with resisting and challenging and taking that risk of saying it's not enforceable. I know it's not enforceable. This you know this over definition of what my um, NDA or innovation assignment agreement uh, claims to be. The the chances are very small. They they will. Um, again, we see this empirically in the, in the studies that um, I've been part of, that they, if they decide to challenge and take risk uh, of, of moving, leaving the competitor and starting something new, most likely they'll, uh, they'll move to another wealthy competitor that can indemnify them and fight their battle. Because I started with Carter Bryant, and I'll end with Carter Bryant. Carter Bryant is, starts as the hero of the story, but in order for Bratz to live, it's like a Greek tragedy, Carter must die, basically. And he, I mean, he literally disappears. He, he's a pawn. This is what a lot of the attorneys that I interviewed about the case, he just becomes a pawn in these two giants that are fighting it out. And, and the David in the story that fights the Goliath is not Carter Bryant. It's really the David is, is a very strong David, which is, um, a sort of he self self uh, defined as like a renegade, uh, bold entrepreneur, now owner of the largest privately held toy company in the world. Really, um, an immigrant, uh, um, Iranian um, American immigrant who just he says about himself that his wife said, you know, you have to be crazy or. Or, or dumb or something to actually go through 10 years of litigation to eventually um, you know, put a halt in the overclaiming of Mattel. And, and uh, Judge uh, David Carter in the second trial says, you know, this, is, this is really important for copyright law, for copyright jurisprudence, that they went through this and said, you, know, you don't own even the you can't own the idea of rats, um, and you don't own an entire empire just because there were some seeds that came from the minds of, of, of somebody that worked for you once. Um, and it's really, and they get, you know, he, he grants punitive damages because of these overclaiming and all that. But, but most of the time, we won't see this. So um, I'm really concerned about how our industries look and how they develop and, and um, what we see as, as our culture, as our innovation. Um, beyond just the tip of the iceberg that we see in litigation. Um, so I think I'll, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear all of your uh, questions. I know uh, there are a bunch of people here that actually know so much uh, about these, these topics and the, this, this case. Um, I'll say that uh, I was really pleased that uh, the New Yorker and the Wall Street Journal and the Times Literary Supplement and, and many more have reviewed uh, the book, it was a, a great experience for me to write something that's kind of more of a full story. And this is actually the Financial Times. They say, um, at its core, You Don't Own Me is an exploration of a relatively dry topic, the intellectual property regime, yet in the hands of Lobel, it becomes something of a page turner. So that's cool. I think intellectual property is always kind of thrilling, um, <laughs> but, but not everybody uh, might agree. Um, I actually also have this final slide that um, this shows some of the ironies of writing a book that has a lot of um, unpacking of what fair use is and what are the limits of um, litigation and, and claiming you know, um, control over speech and creativity. And then the publisher, my publisher, which is a fabulous publisher, Norton, um, gets nervous. <laughs> about you know how I'm writing a book about Mattel, and um, they at first designed this this uh, slide on the right where you see a shaded Barbie already you know very shaded uh, you know you can't think that she'll replace in some way this this book cover um, the pink shelves <laughs> of, of Toys R Us. Um, and yet, they, even though it was already the cover in the London Book Fair catalog and other book catalogs and on their website, um, they pull it, the general counsel pulls that cover um, out and says, no, this is too risky. We need to have 
more shade and, and we can't have her in the center Barbie or like some allusion to Barbie. We have to have both dolls. There's nothing, this is part of my claim. I'm like, you, did you read the book? Um, <laughs> uh, but part of my claim is that um, there's a lot of ideas about what intellectual property is that are embedded in contracts and embedded in practices and you know everywhere that have very little to do with what intellectual property actually is, but they have a huge impact on, on, on uh, how we behave, what we do, um, how we exchange, and how we create. Thank you. <laughs>